Happy Monday. Really, seriously, I I did want to start off the week on an upbeat note. I mean, Phil Mickelson winning the PGA at the age of 50, you know, major triumph for the old. Um, But I'm just going through my notes this morning. The explosion of anti-Semitic violence around the country, the hijacking of a plane in uh, Belarus, Uh, you know, to capture this dissident journalist. Apparently, there's going to be no compromise on the infrastructure. And, of course, Marjorie Taylor Greene's mind-bendingly stupid comments about the Holocaust and masks. But, hey, so welcome back, Will Salatin from Slate. I appreciate it. Hey, Charlie. Great to be with you. So I have to say that my favorite story of the day – I actually have two favorite stories, but but one of them is from is from your publication about the uh, legislation down in Alabama. I don't know whether you've been following this. Uh, Alabama has decided to repeal its decades old ban on yoga in schools. Huh? No, this is, this is, they're, they're, they're getting around to this. So even in Alabama, but of course it's Alabama. So there has to be certain caveats as Slate points out. So under the new law, yoga instructors are barred by law from using any Sanskrit names for poses and have to refer to them using their English equivalent only. This is good, okay? There will be no ums in the schoolhouse. Mantras are forbidden, uh, as is chanting of any kind. No chanting in Alabama, in Alabama schools. In fact, the state legislature has banned the use of the salutation uh, namaste. Is that how I pronounce Because I don't do yoga, you know? <laughs> oh, I think you can't do it. So as if that version of yoga weren't watered down enough, the state will also require participating students to get a permission slip from mommy or daddy, and they write the text into the bill of the permission slip. Quote, I understand that yoga is part of the Hinduism religion. <laughs> I, I, I give my child permission <laughs> to participate in yoga instruction in school. Um, good to double check just to make sure the yoga is not sneaking up on anybody in Alabama. But so you're kind of pretty, you can do the yoga, you can do the, like the whatever dog pose, you got to, have to call it that in English. And uh, you understand that it's part of the Hinduism religion, which apparently they're worried about in Alabama. So I, I appreciate that, uh, Will. That you guys reported that, that. That that's that's really wonderful. That 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 I would call the party of limited government standing on its head. Yeah, something. That's, that's the pose. Yeah, no, something like like that. So the other, my other favorite story of the day is no, where did I, where did I actually have this? The, the story of uh, Sonderland. What did I actually? Did I, I I think I might have um, I, I I might have deleted it. The 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 story of. Uh, what is it, Sonderland, the guy that testified uh, during the campaign? Gordon, yeah. Gordon Sonderland. Yeah, Gordon Sonderland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he is suing um, for $1.8 million for legal fees because he says that that Mike Pompeo and other folks in the Trump administration had promised that they would pay his legal fees before he gave the, uh, you know, somewhat um, at the time felt like bombshell testimony. And then they reneged on it, which seems really, really, really on brand for Trump world that they would have promised to pay his bill and then not do it. Right. So that's great. OK, so, Will, it is Monday. Where, 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 where do you want to start this morning? Where, where should we kick uh, off? I don't here? know. There's, there's stuff all over the place. There was I, I was watching Sunday shows yesterday. So the thing that I was laughing about personally was for like several weeks, Republicans were complaining that Repu- that Democrats wanted to drag out a January 6th commission uh, into the 2022 election. They were determined to have a provision in the legislation that required the commission to wrap up by December 31st, 2021, which is pretty difficult to do given the scope of things they'd have to cover. But the point was to get it over with before the 2022 election season could begin. And then I'm sitting there watching Roy, Senator Roy Blunt, the Republican, yeah. saying, you know, it's really too early to have a commission. We should <laughs> you know, wait until next year. So they're they're not even bothering to get their story straight. It's just like whatever they can float to excuse not doing the commission. No, that's exactly right. It's like they're not even bothering to come up with coherent excuses. Um, Jim, do we have that Ron Ron John uh, cut? This is, uh, you know, my senator, Ron, Ron Johnson. Who is 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 going full? Um, you know, I had them with the strawberries paranoia about all of this. So he's on with is it Tucker Carlson explaining uh, the why some Republicans went along with the January sixth commission. Let's let's play Ron Johnson or R- Ron John's paranoia that this is just a nonpartisan effort to get to the truth. What do you think this is really about? 
Oh, absolutely not. And what, what this is all about is uh, that they're probably figuring out they can't impeach Donald Trump for a third time. So this is the only way they can keep their false narrative that there were thousands of armed insurrectionists as uh, the storm the Capitol, intent on overthrowing this government. And then by extension, they can paint with a very broad brush that the 75 million Americans that voted for Donald Trump are also what? potentially domestic terrorists and would be armed exactly. insurrectionists themselves if, if the FBI doesn't intervene soon enough. So this is all about a narrative that paints Donald Trump supporters as threats to this nation. And, and to continue, uh, the, the most severe crackdown on civil liberties since the Woodrow Wilson administration. It's oh, terrifying oh, we, oh, what's going on. Terrifying. So why, why have some Republicans fallen for this in the House? 35 of them, I think. Well, I suppose some of them take a look at uh, what the media has done to me nah. for pushing back. They pretty well take a look at me as a roadkill, roadkill. and say, ooh, don't, don't want any of that. Um, so there's, there's an enormous amount yeah. of media pressure. And it's just amazing. Your, your previous guest uh, has yeah. been vilified as well. It's amazing how you get attacked for just telling obvious and simple truths. <laughs> Where are the real victims here, Will? They're all <laughs> they're all against me. Yeah, so why? Why? Because I, all these Republicans sitting around going, hey, boy, we don't want to have happen to us. What's happening to Ron Johnson? Right. That's the media <laughs> pressure. This is what's going on in his head. And it's it's this this embrace of the victim culture that. It's not just the, 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 the rioters and the insurrectionists. That they're coming after all 75 million Americans who voted for Donald Trump. Wow, he, it's kind of wrap, wrapped up there in a big crazy ball, isn't it? It, it is. And, you know, Charlie, I, I'm used to hearing this kind of talk, but not from the right. right. You know, this, <laughs> right. This, is, this is sort of the wacky civil libertarian left, right? The people who say, I mean, I believe in civil liberties, but the people who try to excuse crime in general, I mean, the, and I see a lot of this going on right now on the left. There, you know, there are increases in crime in various cities, and I see people on the left trying to excuse it, and you know, it, this is oh, these these are just poor, underprivileged people, and they have to do crime, and that, and what I'm hearing is Ron Johnson and Republicans doing exactly the same thing, just on behalf of all the white people who invaded the Capitol. You know, I'm glad to hear you say that because, uh, you know, many, many years ago, um, I wrote a book, a, a Nation of Victims, which when I wrote it, it was, you know, it, you know, talking about how everybody in America can make themselves into a victim. Uh, I did not anticipate that the uh, conservative movement would embrace victimization, that this was they were all in on this. But this is the this is it. You know, would, would you remind me to get back to the crime issue later? Because this is becoming kind of a big thing. Uh, and 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 I'm and I'm not sure that that uh, folks on the left understand how it's playing. Uh, you know, we might as well talk about it right now because you had an interesting tweet about this, uh, which I thought made exactly the right point. You know, we have the murder rate that's spiking uh, double digits. I mean, it was a massive increase last uh, you know last year. You do have more urban disorder. There is the indications of things kind of breaking down. Story over the weekend in the New York Times about San Francisco. It's become the shoplifting capital of the world. People just walk into Walgreens and take whatever they want, and nobody does anything. They don't even bother to call the cops anymore. So Walgreens is shutting down all of its stores because they can't stay in business because it's so bad. You know, this is one of those issues that, you know, and I think you made the point on a lot of cultural social issues. There's been a movement toward the left, but I don't but not when it comes to attitudes towards public safety and crime. So this is a problem, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, crime, it, it, what I thought what I was trying to just say in that tweet was there are issues where public opinion has shifted what I would say to the left, right? Like homosexuality marijuana, if you look at polling on those two issues over decades, um, there has just been an enormous sea change. People it, it, people have just become more libertarian about that. So some people would say that's not to the left, it's to, to, to freedom, right? And the Republican Party in a lot of ways is just abandoning those issues. I mean, they're sort of still there, but really the party doesn't fight about them the way it used to because they realized that the new generation of people are just like, let live and let live. Crime is not a live and let live issue, right? I mean, if you get mugged, you get mugged. That's not uh, somebody's freedom. That's their freedom to take away your freedom. And so I, I just think a lot of folks on the left don't appreciate that ordinary people will get angry about that and that if they feel like they are being governed by liberal politicians who don't take that issue seriously, they'll throw those people out of office and replace them with 
conservative politicians who promise to solve the problem. I'm not saying the conservatives will solve the problem, but boy, they will promise to do it. They will promise to get tough and people will like that and people will vote for it. Well, and I think we've got a lot of history that would suggest that that's true. Okay, so let's let's go back to the the, the January sixth commission and the conservatives playing the victim card about it. I I, I had missed when I first uh, listened to this cut uh, Tucker Carlson trying to compare the crackdown on the actual rioters to Woodrow Wilson's crackdown during the Red Scare, which is uh, rather creative. Um, but this this now is becoming mainstream on the right that the the effort to hold the actual rioters accountable, arresting the people who invaded the Capitol, that somehow that's oppressive, that that's tyrannical, which is an interesting flex that I have to admit I didn't see coming. Yeah, I mean the the this idea that the government is the enemy. Yeah, uh, and that when the gov- when the government confronts chaos and when the government confronts lawbreaking, it's the government we should fear. That you know, there's a tradition of that. That tradition is on the on the left, on the yeah, civil libertarian right. left, and and Tucker Carlson in particular is an illustration of what happens when the right just decides, hey, what if we adopt all the tropes of the left. Um, about being discriminated against, about our rights being taken away, about the government is always evil. Charlie, I was just looking at polling on um, issues like, you know, the favorable ratings of the FBI, the CIA, that basically all of these government organizations that either stand for national security or uh, arrest people who break the law, the polls have turned upside down. I mean, the, you get much higher approval ratings on the left now than you do on the right for those for those agencies. Yeah, it's sort of we, we back the blue, except if they arrest us, in which case it's, uh, you know, everything's up in the air. Um, George Will was on yesterday. I think he was on um, uh, ABC and he was talking about uh, this. The uh, no, what was he on? Um, well, anyway, George Will was on and he he was talking about. Uh, the the uh, January sixth commission and the reluctance of Republicans to uh, to go along with it, and he 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 made a very very strong case for why we should move ahead with it. Let's play George Will. All right, there we heard Susan Collins say she's so optimistic Stu. for something going forward in this January sixth commission. It's kind of hard to believe it's even controversial. Well, it's controversial for one reason: we have something new in American history that is a political party defined by the terror it feels for its own voters. That's the Republican Party right now. Every elected official is frightened of his voters, therefore doesn't respect his voters, doesn't like his voters, and is afraid that a vote for this will be seen as an insult to the 45th president. There's no reason. I mean, McConnell has a point. There are going to be lots of investigations. Journalists are going to go through this. There are 450 some criminal charges now being brought with 100 more probably to come. So there's going to be lots of information about this. I would like to see. January 6th is burned into the American mind as firmly as 9-11, because it was that scale of, of shock to the system. And I think there will be a commission, but it is controversial for that reason. No, I think he's right. Will Salatin? Yeah. I mean, listening to that just reminds me of, when, you know, when I was a kid growing up, Charlie, the the Republican Party was the party of that stood up to bad guys, right? I mean... Mm-hmm. I, you might disagree with their policy and, you know, or the military invasion in this or that place or, but, but what they stood for was there were bad people in the world, in the, the Soviet Union, its satellites, and they were going to stand up to that. And the, the, just the sh- thing that has shocked me about this period, it no longer shocks me because it's been going on for years, is that this party of Republicans turned out to be the party of the most craven appeasers. I mean, the cowardice in this, in the leadership of this party, so-called, just runs so deep. They, the, Trump is out of office and they still will not break free of him. I mean, that was the gamble Liz Cheney took, right? When, when the impeachment vote came up, the guy is heading out. Here's our chance to break away. And I have friends who are conservatives who said, this is all going to end with the party repudiating Trump. Don't worry. It'll just be a bad, you know, time from the past. And instead, what has happened is they remain terrified of the Trump voters and no one, now almost no one in this party will stand up and say, no, this is wrong. This was an attack on the United States, on the capital of the United States. So the cowardice is just what stands out to me.
And the transformation. Um, I, I wasn't sure I was going to get to this soundbite, but uh, former Secretary of Defense Robert Gates uh, was also on yesterday, and he, he talked about how the Republican Party has become unrecognizable. Let, let's play Robert Gates. Let me take you back to your CIA days, an, analyzing other countries. If you were analyzing the political structure of the United States as a CIA analyst, and the minority party believed that the majority of the voters in that party believed that the president was illegitimate. How would you assess the stability of the political organization of that country? I would have serious concerns about the future. You know, I've, I, I, worked for, I worked for eight presidents. Five of them were Republicans. I don't think any of them would recognize the, the Republican Party today. And what does that mean? Well, I think that, I think in terms of values and the principles that the Republican Party stood for under those five presidents uh, are hard to find these days. Yeah, that's, <laughs> I, th I think he shares your, your incredulity about what's happened to this party. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think what's happened, you, you would probably know better than I, you, you, I don't, I didn't grow up Republican. I saw, I saw it from the outside, but it seems the party just seems to have lost all moorings, you know, and illustrated obviously most clearly by a, not having a platform last time around. And so you, they're, now they're just sort of blowing in the wind. And so none of there's they might every once in a while stand up for something that corresponds to old Republican values. But you run down the list of what the Republican Party used to stand for national security, rule of law, um, tough on crime, uh, fiscal responsibility, uh, limited government. I mean, it just values they, they they don't seem to believe in anything at all yeah and per, so, personal re, personal responsibility common sense uh the you know character counting all of those things were central to what conservatives used to believe yeah i mean the you know january 6th was a lot of things but one thing it was was simply an attack on the capital of the United States in a way no foreign power had managed to do, you know, and that's why we, we were, we're going to have these investigations of why weren't we more prepared? Why wasn't law enforcement more prepared? They didn't expect it to come from, you know, the, the from conservative Trump supporters, but that's where it came from. And, and so you, that you, we can excuse people maybe for saying, okay, we didn't realize that at the time, but now, now that it's happened, Surely, surely you stand up and say, okay, clearly a major national security threat that we failed to anticipate that happened was this attack. And instead, they're just trying to wipe it away like it never happened. So let's talk about other major things that are in the news in this last week. We we had the we have a ceasefire in Israel. We have that hijacking in Belarus. Which one do you want to talk about first? I mean, I, I'm, well, I, feel, I feel like like flipping the coin on on you know days like today. Well, I, I haven't written about Israel and partly, yeah. you know, it's just a it's a hot topic. And before you go in, you better get all your facts. Right. Lined up. But but I am struck by the parallels between the way I he, I see the right talking about anti-Semitism and the way that the left talks about racism. Um, and actually, Jonathan Chait uh, wrote an article in, in uh, New York magazine about about the same phenomenon. And it's so this goes back to Tucker Carlson. Um, I'm not, you know, anti-Semitism is a problem, right? There, there is anti-Semitic incidents have increased just as there have been actual racist incidents, but there's also a very broad interpretation of what counts as anti-Semitism. And so I see criticisms of the Israeli government of, in particular of the Likud government being framed by the right as anti-Semitic. And what, Charlie, what that looks like to me is the right, once again, adopting the tactics of the left. You take something that is real and then you just broaden it so that you can, I'm looking for a nicer word than smear, but kind mm -hmm. of smear your enemy as a bigot for criticizing a policy. Yeah, it be it's it's a it's a way of 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 saying shut up or of stigmatizing anybody on the opposition to have that broad brush. That's an, that is actually an interesting point. Um, we are seeing this outbreak of uh, anti-Jewish violence in this country, which is really stunning. Uh, I'm trying to remember the last time we had anything like this, and uh, I, I do I do think that in our polarized environment, people are having a a hard time getting their handles on on this because I'm I'm noticing that a lot of people are you know. Uh, 
particularly on on the left, have been tweeting out uh, kind of an all lives matter um, theme about all of this. Like, you know, we beat up a few Jews. So suddenly it's like, hey, people, all lives matter. We need to deal with anti-Muslim violence. We need to deal with anti-Jewish violence. They really, really don't want to deal with the fact that we have this very, very specific thing going on right now in rather horrific ways. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right about that. And I apologize. I'm laughing because no. it's a very serious subject, but yeah. the irony of it sort of strikes me that, you know, in the same way that the the right has adopted the tactics of the left in terms of dubious accusations of anti-Semitism, you know, the left has adopted the tactics of the right in terms of wishing away the real thing, right? And so so in the case of this all lies, that, that's a, exactly, that's a great insight. Um, the left feels obliged to say, well, we can't just say the anti-Semitism is wrong because then, you know, that would be slighting the the Muslims. Who've been, and I have like, I take a backseat to nobody in having criticized Islamophobia. I've been on that case for years since the whole so-called ground zero mosque controversy. So the, you know, it, that Islamophobia is a real thing. It is a real problem. And it is, you know, still going on today. But we have this, this demonstrable, documented, quantified surge in anti-Semitism. It's okay to say Black Lives Matter. And it's okay to say the surge is in anti-Semitism. And, and that's the problem we need to address specifically. Okay, so this is a good segue to get into um, Marjorie Taylor Greene over the weekend, who said some stupid things. And uh, interestingly enough, a lot of the criticism was that she was stoking anti-Semitism. I'm not that clear about that. I mean, I'm, I'm clear that, you know, the woman's completely demented and uh, historically ignorant. But let, let's let's go to uh, let's go to the tape on this one. Mar- and I, I again, I, I feel a little bit a um, little bit guilty because we can, we could do this every single day, just like we could do Tucker Carlson. And I try to avoid it with tremendous lack of success. Uh, but over the weekend, here's the first Marjorie Taylor Greene goes on one of these sketchy networks and uh, attacks Nancy Pelosi for being mentally ill for pushing a mask mandate in the House of Representatives. So here's here's Marjorie Taylor Greene number one. This woman is mentally ill. You know, we can look back in a time in history where people Projection. were told to wear a gold star what? and they were definitely treated like second class citizens, so much so that they were put in trains and taken to gas chambers what? in Nazi Germany. And this is exactly the type of abuse that Nancy Pelosi is talking about. What? Well, let's talk about the queen of the House of Hippo. What the fuck is she talking <laughs> about? Will? I mean, I seriously... Yet Nancy Pelosi thinks she should wear a mask on the floor of the house. You can debate that, you know, with the vaccination, whatever. But she goes right to the, you know, this is Nancy Pelosi wants to put people in boxcars and send them to, you know, Dachau. Right. Well, you know, this is nobody holds back Marjorie Taylor Greene from going straight to the Nazi analogy as at her earliest it's, it's, opportunity. It's the only one she's got. <laughs> Apparently. I mean, it's just so stupid. OK, so she was given a chance. OK, did you really mean to go with that? Did you really mean to trivialize the Holocaust by saying that requiring people to wear masks in the House of Representatives is like the murder of six million Jews? Did you really mean that? And of course, Marjorie Taylor Greene did. She doubled down here. American Jewish Congress has expressed concern over your comments comparing mask mandates to the Holocaust. Do you stand behind those comments? You know, here's what I here's what I stand by. We shouldn't be having this kind of treatment. No one should be treated like a second class citizen for saying I don't need to wear a mask or saying that my medical records are my privacy based on my HIPAA rights. And so I stand by all of my statements. I said nothing wrong. And I think any any rational Jewish person didn't like what happened in, in Nazi Germany and any rational didn't Jewish like. person doesn't like what's happening with overbearing mass mandates and overbearing vaccine policies. Do you understand, though, why some would be upset and offended by the comment? No. Well, do you understand how people feel about being forced to wear masks or being forced to have to take a vaccine or even have to say that whether they've taken it or not? These are just things that shouldn't be happening in America. This is a free country, and it's just ridiculous to have these kind of conversations. All right. Well, I'm going to take a deep breath here. <laughs> uh... well, well, speaking, speaking, if I may, for the rational Jewish people, mm-hmm. I will admit she's right. I, I did not like what yeah, happened yeah, in the Holocaust. I, I didn't. I didn't like it. I, I really didn't like it. I disapprove, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so that's true. But you know, where did she learn that? Where did she learn that uh, when you say something 
that's clearly wrong. You don't apologize. apologize. You never apologize. She learned it, I think, from Donald Trump. I mean, every, nobody had to learn that. But what people learned from Trump was that you could do it and get away with it. And in the Republican Party, no one will be, you know, no one will turn their back on you. No one will reject you. So she's she's just going to go with that. No, she is. Um, also, by the way, just a, a, a historical note in case Marjorie Taylor Greene is listening into this. Um, I don't think that it would be appropriate to generally refer to Jews in the Holocaust as being treated like second class citizens. Um, I think it's a little bit worse than that. But yeah, they, this this lack of apology, this refusal, and it's not just her. It's it, it has changed the the tone, and we we talk about you know the tone of debate, the dumbing down of debate, what's happening with the polarization, this refusal to ever apologize, ever back off, and you see it with with Ted Cruz and Rand Paul, and it's no matter what stupid thing they've said, it's just like, no, we're just going to keep pushing it and pushing it and pushing it. So there we have Marjorie Taylor. And you're right. Um, there will be no sanction. Um, and I, I, this is almost becoming redundant now, but Liz Cheney has been uh, canceled uh, by the Republican Party, uh, but Marjorie Taylor Greene is still uh, in good standing along with Matt Gates. So speaking of Liz Cheney, should we talk about Liz Cheney a little bit? You want to talk about Liz Cheney? Sure. OK, so she was on Axios. I don't have the soundbite uh, with Jonathan Swan, who is an outstanding uh, interviewer. And she, you know, once again, is not backing off. But he pressed her on how she felt about the voter suppression laws being pushed in the various state governments. And she really d refused to connect the dots. She didn't want to connect the dots between Donald Trump's big lie uh, about the election and all of these uh, these changes that are being made at the state level. So there's she's getting some blowback. How do you not see that? Um, where, what do you think about the Liz Cheney's position on that? Okay, Wait, Charlie, this yeah. is my chance to take a position to your right. <laughs> so to I'm my gonna, right. Okay. I'm going to go there. I'm going to defend Liz Cheney on this one. Uh, and I don't know I what she's- I did not see that coming. I just worked it out. Okay. I don't know exactly what she's thinking, but uh, I, I'm sympathetic to her general approach here. So my my view of the whole situation we're in is we are- we, the, the danger here is that we have this cancer of just complete disinformation and denialism, just lying. OK, and it is it is located in the Republican Party right now, but it can easily spread out from there to the extent the Republican Party takes over Congress. It's going to take over the government. Um, it was already in the White House. Uh, and that is the enemy. And that when you are up against an enemy this grave, you have to unite against it. And part of uniting means you're not going to focus on fighting about peripheral things, even things that are adjacent to this. So I believe that it is very important to distinguish these policy disputes over the particulars of these uh, election laws being passed in Georgia and Florida and uh, Texas and other places from just lying, plain old lying about the 2020 election and uh, trying to overturn it and the coup that was attempted to overturn it. Uh, I, so therefore, I do not want people to think that in order to agree about the 2020 election and the lies that have come from it and the and the attempted coup that came from it, that they have to agree with the left about every particular, say, of the Georgia law, which is a much more complicated topic. So I am with Liz Cheney in saying, let's separate those two issues and focus on the big lie. Well, what is interesting is that she has resisted any of the temptation to move to the left on any of these issues. Um, and, and, and I think that's what makes her more of a threat in many ways uh, to, uh, to to Trump world is is because she is not watering down her conservative credentials. On the other hand, and by the way, I, I don't completely disagree with you. However, I thought Jonathan Swan made a great uh, point when he said, so what were the problems in the election in Florida or Georgia or Texas that justifies these laws? I mean, how do you not comment on the fact that your party is embracing efforts to make it harder to vote? Um, I don't know whether they talked about Arizona or not, but I mean, that's just, you know, you know, crazy, crazy sort of things. Um, I, I, I think you're right, though, that she's just trying to not be distracted. Like, let's keep our eye on this one fundamental position. OK, so one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you this week was you had a very in-depth story analysis uh, in, 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 in Slate, arguing that this the purge of Liz Cheney could end up backfiring on Republicans. Now, this was 
counterintuitive to to a lot of folks who are saying, well, well I mean, okay, not to, to everybody, but to a lot of the conventional wisdom, which is that Republicans figure nobody's paying attention to that. They're going to win in 2022 anyway. Um, there are no consequences for decisions like that. And the, the, the party is pretty much united around going along with the big lie. So, so make your case that purging Liz Cheney could backfire in in, in in some real way against the Republicans? Well, to backfire, it doesn't have to be, they, they don't have to piss off a majority of Republicans. They just have to piss off enough Republicans to lose enough votes to lose elections in 2022. Um, and there's evidence that that already happened in 2020. They lost Arizona. Uh, they alienated a lot of McCain supporters, a lot of Flake supporters. And, you know, if you look at the exit polling in Arizona, uh, that was decisive. That 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 the Republicans would have won that state in the presidential election for sure, if they had been able to maintain Republicans at the rate that they had maintained them in other states. So, so the 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 argument for this backfiring is, you can only abuse what is probably fifteen to twenty percent of your party for so long. Uh, it, it, about fifteen to twenty percent of the party was on Liz Cheney's side in this dispute. I'm talking about rank and file, people who in polls say they're Republicans. Uh, if you break it down a little further and say, yeah, a lot of those people are not really going to turn on the party, there's about 7 to 8% of the Republican Party that is like a Charlie Sykes, pe mm -hmm. people who say, you know, look, this was Trump lost the election. The, the rest is lying. And people who say, look, we, we have to stand for the rule of law. That's what part of what being a Republican is. And if you tell those people, not only, you know, are you a minority in the party, but we're going to kick anyone who represents you out of our leadership. You know, some of those people would just walk. And the, the argument inside the party is clearly, look, we need the Trump supporters. We don't need those people. They're a fringe. Well, Arizona is a warning of what can happen to you when you just say they're the fringe. So the way this could play out is in 2022, here's Kevin McCarthy expecting to take back the House. And instead, they just lose a whole series of close House races because this small fraction of Republicans took a walk, either stayed home, voted third party, some of them voted for the Democrat, and they just punished the Republican Party for telling them to go to hell. So what they're counting on is that the voters will not be voting up or down on Republican po policies or or any of this sort of thing, that they will be reacting to what they perceive to be overreach by the Democrats, the entire thrust of the Republicans next year will be that the the Democrats under Joe Biden have just gone too far. They're spending too much money. They're too woke. They're too so socialist, whatever. On the issue of crime, for example, if that becomes a salient issue, doesn't that override things like this? It could. It could. And it's part of why I would like, you know, <laughs> I would like the Democratic Party not to overreach, particularly where there's no point in overreaching, like in ignoring crime. You know, there's nothing progressive about ignoring crime or pretending it's not increasing or, you know, trying to excuse it away. Um, you know, you, you, you try to solve the problem, but you also put people in jail, you know, you, you and I mean, this thing, the thing in San Francisco is a pretty good example. It's like, looks like there was a very left wing policy that was passed. It seems to correlate in at least a couple of cities with uh, in increases in shoplifting and you know, we got to change that law. We got to show people that you don't have to be crazy to be progressive or to, or to support. Them. I mean, that's part of the magic of Joe Biden, right? Like Joe Biden was able to sell a lot of people who are in the middle or the center right on the idea of like, all right, I'm a Democrat and I'm a progressive about a lot of things, but I'm not crazy. And if you give those people a home, they will do the job of punishing the Republican Party. So I wasn't planning on bringing this up, but 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 among things that that I think would actually move voters or harden the partisan polarization, I was reading uh, an in-depth piece in the New York Times yesterday about uh, how farmers are reacting to this policy of giving um, large amounts of money specifically designated for minority farmers. Yeah, I don't know whether you saw the same story, but mm -hmm. uh, black farmers, there's a lawsuit involving some folks here in Wisconsin about all of that. Um, what was very clear is it, it's not that huge amount of money, and clearly it's justifiable in terms of righting historical wrongs. However, from a political point of view, the amount of resentment it is generating among white farmers who have also been struggling and have had their own issues, that they are not eligible because of the color of their skin. And you know this is going to the courts because it is a race-based aid program. 
this strikes me as the kind of thing that was, um, uh, I, I think, ill-advised in the sense that um, it, it is it, it will foment a backlash in the areas where Democrats have already been hurting, which is like, how are you going to get back rural voters? This is not the way to do it. Yeah, I mean, this is reminding me very much of Bill Clinton's old uh, line that, you know, on affirmative action, we should mend it, not end it, right? I mean, there is, this is, I think that race is one of those issues where, uh, r- racial remedies is an issue where you need to fine tune the policy, right? There are, there are so many ways. First of all, I agree with the left. There has been this, you know, l- decades and centuries of discrimination, white against black. So, you, you, we can't just go to neutrality and expect everything to rectify right away. So I'm in favor of doing some compensatory some remedies, but you got to, I think you're exactly right. You got to be shrewd about how you spend that political capital. Cause there's this thing that I would call moral friction. We see it in the case of abortion policy, but also in the case of affirmative action, you are going up against the intuitions of a lot of people that we should not discriminate in, in favor of anyone. Right. And so it, you there have got to be ways of organizing the pol- of designing the policy so that it isn't just a, just frontally abrasive in the way that it treats white people well and, and this i think extends to the entire debate about race that we're having or the conversation that we're pretending to have about about race which has become so bad faith uh, you mentioned jonathan chait a little bit earlier he had a really interesting observation over the weekend um about this debate about you know, the 1619 project, critical race theory, uh, the Trump administration, 1776. Uh, and it is this massive food fight. And, you know, the reality is, is that the 1619 project has a lot of problems with it, a lot of factual problems. They handled it badly. Uh, you know, clearly there are issues, you know, critical race theory. There have been a lot of critique, critiques about it. But what's happened is we've made these things into cartoons. And and one of the things that Chade observed was that People with extreme views often prefer to polarize the debate so that they do not need to engage with more measured critics or compete with more reasonable alternatives. So, for example, with 1619, you know, a lot of the defenders want to ignore all the problems. They want to think of this as just simply a white conservative racist attack on them, as opposed to dealing with the fact that the harshest critics of 1619 Project have been socialists, have been people on the left, have been, uh, you know, very well-known historians who are making very nuanced, very intelligent critiques of all of that. But, But we all prefer if we have the most extreme demagogic opponent then we don't have to deal with that. And that that was a very interesting observation that in our debates, we hide behind the polarization in some ways. No, I think that's exactly right. I mean, in the, in the case of the 1619 Project, I, had, I wasn't sure how to deal with this issue. But my, my general outlook is I'm, I'm in favor of the project. I'm in favor of the whole idea of saying, hey, what if the story of America is not the story of the white people. It's the story of the slaves and what the sla- and, and the slaves becoming uh, acknowledged f- Americans with full rights. You know, yeah. and I mean, this is yeah. I'm Jewish. I have a model for this. It's called the Passover story. Mm-hmm. The Passover story is not about the Egyptians. It's about the Jews. And so I love this idea of taking history and saying, what if you know the 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 Americans of today, about whom this this was the story, the the protagonists are the the descendants, the slaves, and the descendants of the slaves. And so I'm willing to cut a lot of slack. And there are major problems with the 1619 Project, but there were major problems with the hist- history written by white Absolutely. people yeah. <laughs> before that. It's not like this 1776 right. idea of clean. So I'm in favor of the project. I'm in. I I'm fine with the criticisms of it. And I think the people who did the project are fine with criticisms of it. They're, they're sniping like historians do. Hey, you know, you're picking at something small, but that's how he, the debates over history work out. So I completely agree with Chait um, that, you know, we, we should just settle down and argue about the particulars and not, you know, make this into a grand conflict of ideologies. Well, it also goes back to this fundamental question about, you know, what is history for? I mean, every there is something, you know, fundamental here. Every society decides how it's going to, you know, tell its own story, how it's going to identify, what it's going to remember, the narrative story. But uh, and, 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 and striking the right um, balance, uh, you know, between wanting to be upbeat and patriotic, uh, but also being self-critical. It's a very, it's a very difficult balance to strike. And I think on the podcast last week, I mentioned that I was really rattled um, about a year or so ago when I realized that I had never heard of the Tulsa massacre. 
I mean, I'm, I'm willing to admit that, um, that, that I, un, until that, and I thought I had understood, uh, American history pretty well. And I'm really getting a sense now about how much has been whitewashed from American history. And these are major events that have been dropped down the memory hole. And there's, there's no justification that, that if we're going to understand, you know, our country and our past, we need to understand that things like this took place. So adding that back in is not anti-American. It's not anti-patriotic. It is in the service of truth. But um, obviously, memory holding events uh, it has a long tradition, uh, not just in our country, obviously, either. It's not helpful for the response from the Republican Party to be they're accusing you of racism. They're they're calling right. the whole country racist. Right. No, so, exactly. You know, it's it's and this is a major problem with all discussions of racism. It's like these are very particular things at particular times done by particular people, and it's okay. It's okay to expose and explore the history of discrimination in this country and abuse and murder, right? And that was not told to people like you and me when we were kids. And with and that, that does not make America irredeemable. It's part of the process of what makes America America, which is that unlike a lot of countries, unlike authoritarian countries, we are going to expose and look at our past and clean it up. Well, you know, and that's one of my problems, I guess, with the more extreme versions of critical race theory is it tells you all the things that you're not supposed to think or not allowed to say. And I think we, I would like to have a really in-depth conversation about this, but it does feel like there are a lot of invisible tripwires um, among that, that that would that would trip up even people of goodwill trying to understand and get to the bottom of all of this. You know, trying to correct that 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 false historical record without um, necessarily putting an entire indictment. So th this is that that problem of the polarization that you know anything that is either you know that if you say these things you're saying America is racist versus if you don't say this other thing that you're racist it's like come on can we just have a conversation i know that sounds naive but you understand what i'm getting at here yeah, yeah. I, I, i'm reading through some of these these stories about some of these extremely woke private schools and, and the list of things attitudes you are not allowed to have uh i mean i mean frankly it sounds more totalitarian than, than it does socratic in its approach to the issue yeah, and and uh, the the simple answer that I would say first of all, I I wrote a whole article about the critical race theory and this and and part of my argument was, if it's going to be critical theory, it needs to be critical, right? And part of critical means that you 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 examine uh, w what's wrong in society and what's wrong in history, and you also examine yourself. You know, you right. can't. It's uncritical to tell people because you are white you must think this, or because you are black or brown or whatever. You you this is the way you must see the world, or that all people of a certain race are bad. It's just it's just not the way the world is, right? So, I'm in favor of critical thinking about race, but I'm not in favor of people using the word critical to mask an ideology. <laughs> You know, I, I wrote in my newsletter today about uh, one of the go-to guys um, in this debate on the right named Christopher Rufo. And uh, to me, he's kind of the, the symbol of the bad faith argumentation that's going on here. I mean, I would like to see a robust debate about uh, critical race theory. But what's happened again is is the, the cartooning of, of it all. He tweeted out, he, this is, a, a, Christopher Rufo is the go-to guy. I mean, he's featured by Hillsdale College, Manhattan's Institute uh, City Journal. He's on Fox News all the time. He was touted by the Heritage Foundation. Apparently it was this guy, Christopher Rufo, who was on Fox News talking about how terrible critical race theory was that inspired Donald Trump to issue the order banning uh, diversity and race sensitivity training in the federal government. So this guy, though, tweets out, kind of gives away the entire game. And these tweets are just stunning. He says, the goal is to have the public read something crazy in the newspaper and immediately think critical race theory. We have decodified the term and will recodify it to annex the entire range of cultural constructions that are unpopular with Americans. Now, well, that is so breathtakingly dishonest, <laughs> basically admitting what we're going to do is we're going to take uh, all kinds of bullshit. And we're going to cram it in there and we're not going to actually talk about critical race theory. We're just going to change its branding. And then he writes, we have successfully frozen their brand, critical race theory, into the public conversation and are steadily driving up negative perceptions. We will eventually turn it toxic and we put all the various cultural insanities under that brand category. 
So in other words, he's sort of admitting, I'm not actually really talking about it. I'm just going to take everything that everyone doesn't like, every possible prejudice, bias, every nutty thing that's out there, and I want people to read about it and think critical race theory. Now, if there's a definition of intellectual dishonesty, this would fit any definition you and I could come up with. I mean, Jesus, this guy makes Lee Atwater sound subtle. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> this is, and I'll tell you, Charlie, I, I go every every day. I am I am going through Fox News videos. I'm looking at the interviews and they are – it's critical race theory, critical race theory. So what he's describing, I am seeing evidence of every day. It's the branding of this term and the use of this term to brand all discussion of race. Exactly. So, and, and if people w- want to look this up, it's in my newsletter today, Morning Shots. I have the screenshots of the uh, of the tweets that he put out uh, this March, just a, just a, a few a few weeks ago. So it is there. So, uh, Will, what are you working on right now? What are you paying attention to? Well, I'm looking at, a, at, at right now at a bunch of polling about uh, the January 6th commission and infrastructure and some some other issues. I'm really fascinated by this cultural inversion that's going on, uh, where the Republicans have moved. You know, they've turned against uh, the law enforcement agencies, many of them against national security agencies. They've turned against football. They've turned against, <laughs> they've yeah, turned right. against the NFL. Cor- uh, corporations. They've turned, they've turned against the American corporate. We're, we're, we're anti, cor- they're anti-corporate now, right? Let me just check. Oh, yes. Uh, Sorry, they're, they're anti-corporate. Absolutely. And therefore, <laughs> cra- all kinds of crackdowns on on companies. It's not just, you know, the big tech. It's just like, it's the companies that wanted to move out of Georgia over the Georgia law. It's all of a sudden, it's the use of the government to tell corporations they can't be woke, right? Uh, and they're more, obviously, they're more pro-Russia. I mean, it's really striking on issue after issue. Just the the, the old culture wars that we grew up with have just turned upside down. Yeah. I, the, one of my favorite stories from last week was uh, was Ted Cruz uh, implying that the U.S. military were a bunch of, what was his term, pansies, um, and using the word emasculated. Um, in, 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 in contrast, our military has been emasculated in contrast to the Russian army. And of course, when he was called out on it, he didn't back up because, uh, you know, he, he he's he, I, I see my theory on that was that he saw that Ron Johnson and and, and Rand Paul were, were leading in the asshole, uh, you know, track. And, and he figured he needed to catch up a little bit. But I mean, if I'm Ted Cruz, I'm staying as far away from the word emasculated as possible. I mean, seriously, <laughs> you know, you look up in the dictionary. There he is. I mean, I'm sorry, but also. Well- yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no. He, uh, I think that's unfair to Ted Cruz. He he played offensive tackle for the Supreme Court litigation team. Oh, jeez. Is that true? No. <laughs> I, 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 just, <laughs> I, I just think it, it's interesting how he's remade himself, though, you know, from from being the the, uh, the you know, the Supreme the, you know, Harvard educated lawyer to now he's he's what, you know, grizzly macho man, the whole beard and everything. I mean, he's like physically made himself over into somebody, you know, tough, tougher. And so we're supposed to forget the, you know, that he's, that he's Cancun Ted. And, and now, <laughs> and, and now he's the manliest man who's going to, he's, who's going to lecture Navy SEALs on how they are pansies compared to Vladimir Putin's shock troops. What the, f- you know, <laughs> <laughs> I, you can't make this up. Will Salatin, thank you so much for coming back on the podcast. We always enjoy it. Uh, thanks, Charlie. It was a lot of fun. Thank you for joining today's uh, Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We will be back tomorrow, and we'll do this all over again.